Okay. Good morning, everyone, once again. Thank you for connecting to this class, BC212, on Christian apologetics. Um, let's take a moment to pray, and we'll get started. Um, could anybody lead us in prayer as we get ready to start, please? Somebody could go ahead, Jafina, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this beautiful day and for the beautiful class we are about to have. God, we place this day and each and every one of my classmates in your hands as Pastor Ashish teaches. Help us to open our heart and mind and listen to it and to take it in our life forever, Jesus. Not just listening to it, but applying it in our life. Help us to understand the deepest mysteries of God. Be with us and guide us. Fill us with your knowledge and wisdom. Uh, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Of Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay, so last week we um, were talking about the Bible. The Bible as a book. Uh, how God inspired it, and practically how the Bible has come to us today. So I'm going to just quickly review. <coughs> Sorry. I'm just going to quickly review what we did last week, and then we're going to move forward. Um, I would uh, encourage all of us uh, to read the lecture notes. Uh, you know, I've tried to condense useful information for us. Uh, so I would encourage you to read the uh, notes uh, in the class. You know, I'm just uh, I'm speaking and I'm uh, just summarizing, or, or maybe giving in brief uh, the 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 material that's there. Uh, but if you read it, you know, uh, you will get uh, more information. So I encourage you to do that. And uh, all right, so let's quickly review what we did last week, and then we move forward uh, to continue our discussion, our learning about the Bible. Right? So we we wanted to answer some questions for ourselves. You know, how do we know that uh, the text of the Bible is accurate? How did the Bible get canonized? That means how were the 66 books in the Bible selected and why were they selected? So we wanted to understand that. And today, uh, so we will finish that part. Uh, uh, today and then we will then move into answering the third question which is you know there are so many different English uh, versions of the English Bible uh, you know how are these versions or translations done and uh, how do we you know select which one to use and so on so uh, we will be doing some of that today now uh, we we said that you know the Bible is the inspired word of God. Uh, it is something uh, we we know from a scriptural basis that God's word is inspired. It's 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 it is what God spoke, but He spoke it through human human people, ordinary people, um, and uh, and so there is this practical side the 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 way the Bible was put together over many. Uh, many many years over a period of at least thousand years, so we went through some of that information. We talked about the Old Testament, mostly written in Hebrew, some parts of it written in Aramaic, and the New Testament. All of it was written in Greek, uh, with around the first century AD, and uh, totally from Genesis. We go from Genesis to Revelation. We were saying uh, the Bible covers thousand five hundred years, sixty six books. 13 and the old, 27 of the new, 40 different authors. So we covered all of that. And then we said, you know, so practically it, it was written on papyrus uh, and then on leather scrolls subsequently. And then it was put in this codex, or which is a, a kind of like a book form, uh, you know, not, not as nice as you know the books of today but it was papyrus or 
animal skin put in that book form. That would be called the Codex. But it was copied very meticulously by these scribes. They hand copied it for many hundreds of years. That's how it was done. You know, it was written by hand. But they were very careful in how they copied. And so we mentioned that, you know, uh, the credentials for ancient text, there are two things. How many manuscripts are there? And how close are we, how close are the manuscripts to when it was originally written, the time gap? So these are two criteria that uh, we look at when we, when we study the text of ancient literature or manuscripts written a long time ago. And so we said, okay, there are so many people, historians and so on. So this is, you know, the numbers. This is what the numbers look like for many of the other texts. Then we kind of got into the details of the Bible itself. So we said, uh, Malachi or the Old Testament ended with the book of the prophet Malachi around 400 BC, 400 years before Christ. Every, you know, the Old Testament, basically what we know as the Old Testament, 66 books, uh, sorry, the 39 books came into existence. The, the books were there. And then there was 400 years of silence, no major prophet. And then, of course, the New Testament came in. But up until 1947, we had the oldest manuscripts we had were from 980. This was with regards to the Old Testament. So 980 and the time gap from then to 480 is about 1,300 years. So that is quite a long time gap. But then what happened was there was a discovery, an amazing discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. That means uh, in at a certain place here in the Qumran Caves near the Dead Sea. I saw this picture here. Uh, they discovered uh, manuscripts that were kept in jars, and basically they found the entire the entire Old Testament, except for the Book of Esther. All the other books were there, preserved, um, and then they compared they compared the text, and I just gave one example where, you know, when you compare the text, uh, and so. Two things. One is the Dead Sea Scrolls were scrolls that were written around 150 BC. So suddenly, uh, the you know we we go from 980 to 150 BC. We're getting closer to the time when you know the oldest book was written. So the time gap suddenly shrinks from 1,300 years to 250 years. And then we also said that in actually comparing the text, and we gave the example the book of Isaiah, Isaiah was written 750 BC. We already had copies from 900 AD. And then you compare it with the copies now that we have found from 150 BC. What we saw was that the, the, the text between 900 AD 150 BC, that's almost 1,000 years. There were hardly any changes. You know, I'm just giving one example. So it shows how careful the scribes were uh, when they were hand copying the text. Very, very careful. So it, it really gives us so much confidence that through time, hundreds, th hundreds of years, over a thousand years, the text has not been, you know, okay, there may be a few minor changes, but essentially the text has not changed. So, if we, and then of course we, uh, there's a, you know, there are other translations from the Hebrew and Aramaic. We've got translations into other languages, the Old Testament. The Greek translation was known as the Septuagint, and we have various copies of the Greek translations. Then we have Latin translations, so many other languages. The New Testament, of course, was, all, was written within a short period of time, the first hundred years. 
uh, AD. And so, again, we have many manuscripts of those. And so if we summarize, you know, um, the number of manuscripts, the time gap of the Old and the New Testament, it is amazing. Uh, compared to all the other ancient texts, we've got more number of manuscripts, and the time gap is pretty small compared to all the other works. So um, it is it is amazing. It's amazing. And in, 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 if you compare the Bible with other works, we see the Bible is uh, amazing in the way it's been preserved and in the way the text has maintained its um, act, authenticity, authentic text, and, and then also the content is very, very different when you compare these these texts. Um, the other, some of the other important things we pointed out was that even the Lord Jesus acknowledged the Old Testament. Many scriptures are there, uh, uh, and uh, if people try to point out any problems with the Bible, uh, the text of the Bible, there are two main things that we need to look into, uh, understand the law of non-contradiction, so we kind of explain that. And also, if we look into the background, then things become clearer. Things that are difficult for us to understand will become better as we are easier to understand, clearer in understanding, if we look into the historical, cultural background. So we covered that. And then we were in this part, talking about the canon of Scripture, on saying, on what basis were these 39 books selected by the Jews, of course, first, and then taken on by the church later on, which we explained last time? What was the basis? And then on what basis did the 27 books of the New Testament, how were they selected? And then uh, what we're going to talk today is how were these put together? Right, so that we get the 66 books of the Bible. So I summarized uh, a lot of this, you could uh, read through it, but essentially what we said is that for the Old Testament, right, for the Old Testament, the Jewish elders, for them, a very important was who was speaking? Was it a prophet of God who was speaking? Right, and uh, was there you know, accuracy uh, uh, in what was being said. So it had to come through a prophet of God, th through inspiration. Yeah. So who was speaking? And then is it consistent? Is it accurate? So very important criteria. So they didn't just take anybody's writings. No, was a pro did a prophet of God speak? So that's why Malachi was the last prophet that they recognized. And they didn't take anything after that, you know. So, uh, so they, so even though there were a lot of other writings after that, the last recognized prophet of God was Malachi, and that's why the Old Testament pauses there, right? And uh, they they did not look at taking the other historical writings, which you know we mentioned about Apocrypha, which is part of the. Uh, Catholic Bible, but we don't recognize that simply because it was not recognized by uh, the Hebrew scholars, the Jewish elders. The New Testament, similarly, but then did an apostle write it? Did was it was it one of the twelve apostles, or was it one of the the apostles recognized by the church? That includes the apostle Paul, and or was it written by somebody? Who are associated with the apostles, right? So that was a very important criteria. Now, so time went on. We'll pick up from here. Uh, as time went on, uh, so keep in mind, a lot of things were orally communicated. Uh, we had the original writings of the prophets and the apostles which made up the Old and the New Testament. And then there was, you know, uh, a lot of, uh, we, we didn't have, so the common man didn't have, you know, like us today, everybody has a copy of the Bible, but that was not the case, not even in the early church, right? 
uh, a lot of it was oral, oral traditions, things that were passed on, you know, so example, example, all right, just think about this. Today, when we come to church, we, each one of us are carrying a Bible. We have a Bible. We can read it ourselves. But that was not the case for people up, you know, well into the, um, the, uh, the early church. There they came, and everything, everything they learned was only what they heard. You know, so they would listen to uh, the teachings. Whether now, before before the church was born, it was in the synagogue. the The scriptures would be read, but everything was oral. You only learned through what was spoken. Uh, same thing in the early church. They didn't have a printed Bible. It was all oral. Everything you learned, everything you knew was what you heard spoken by the apostles. Um, now, there was a time when, and this was you know, around the first three, four hundred years, slowly the, they moved away from oral to the writings of the apostles and the Old Testament prophets. Right. So the focus was now on the written scripture slowly now because remember still now copies are not available, it's not in print largely. Uh, you're still depending on learning through oral tradition, but then now the focus is shifting to we have the writings of the apostles, we are making copies of it, we need to know what, which, what are the writings we're going to follow? What are the writings are just, you would say, literature, right? So we need to distinguish or we need to separate that out. So how do we do it? How do we say these writings are what we will call scripture and the other writings are just literature? How do we do it? So um, slowly, over time, I'm talking. We're still in the first 400 years of the church. There were various um, councils. Councils meaning meetings of leaders. Uh, so it was not one person who was making this decision, but there were various councils uh, who of church leaders who, through their discussions and through their, you know. Uh, to their conversation discussions, they decided or they began to recognize certain writings as scriptural text. So we have here, and I've just listed out these various councils. It's not like you need to know them by heart, but what we, what we need to know is that, that there were various, uh, you would say, meetings of elders, councils of elders, who through their various discussions began to recognize the 27 books of the New Testament. The Old Testament, 39 books, was already done by the Jewish elders. That was passed on to the church because the church was born out of Judaism, like we explained last week. But now, the 27 books, that means the, the writings of the early apostles, had to be recognized. This, these are the writings. Copies were being made, you know, the letters of the Gospels and the letters of the uh, of Paul and the other apostles, it was there, copies were being made. But now we have to recognize these 27 books and not any other writings. So we had various councils over, the, especially in the in, in, in 8300, um, the, the first, within the first 400 years. And uh, finally, the, the Council of Hippo and the Council of Carthage, just short, short period of time between each other, within a four-year period, they recognized these 27 writings, 27 uh, books as part of the New Testament. The criteria, like we mentioned earlier, is it had to be spoken or written by the apostles, sorry, had to be written by the apostles, or by those recognized as the apostles, or those who are associated with the apostles. That's very important criteria. 
So there they recognized these councils, the Council of Hippo, the Council of Carthage, which was basically the church elders who came together, discussed, decided. And we trust, we believe that God's hand was on these men, uh, these people, as they came together and said, you know, we will recognize these 27 books as canon of scripture. That means these are the 27 books that meet the standard by which we will say these are this is scripture. So that's what's called canon, means they meet a standard. What is the standard? It had to be written by the apostles or those associated with the apostles. We recognize these, that's it. So they put them together with the 39 books of the Old Testament, which was already there, and that became the Holy Bible for us. Or we say the canon of Scripture. When you say the canon of Scripture, we refer to the whole Bible, 39 books of the Old Testament, 27 books of the New Testament, and they became the canon of Scripture. All right? Uh, just some few things, uh, and then we will take time for question and answers. Um, so, you know, this is just general information. So the, uh, the term Bible or Ta Biblia can be traced back to about 223 AD. And the early church father, uh, John Chrysostom, uh, he seems to be the first person or the earliest person we can recognize who began to use this term, Ta Biblia. Uh, uh, as a writer, and so somewhere there, you know, within the first 200 years, but in a more formal way, within the first 400 years, this term, the Bible, started being used to refer to the scriptures that, uh, you know, 39 books and later on, along with the 27, uh, the, canon, the whole canon of scripture was referred to as the Bible, right? So once it was, so that term continued on, and once it was formally recognized by the end of the fourth century, that term remained for these 66 books. Later on, remember, all, all, all up, uh, you know, the, up until that time, it was not in chapter and verse, but later on, uh, when the Geneva Bible was published, that is much, much later, 1560, that's when chapter and verse was made, or the Bible was put in chapter and verse. And just from a, the whole point of view was to reference it uh, in, 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 in preaching and so on. So that happened only in 1560 uh, from the Geneva Bible. So uh, that's just again general information. So I'm going to pause here. Uh, the next part is in talking about Bible translation, which is again something we need to understand. So I'm going to pause here. Let's see if there are any questions and then we will move forward. Any questions? Let me look at the chat. Okay. Let's see. Um, Colossians, um, John Paul, uh, there's a question here. Colossians 4.16, when this apple is read among you, see that it is read also the church of the Laodiceans, and that you also likewise read the epistle uh, from Laodicea. Why is that not important to us? Now, there could have been, as we see here in uh, Colossians 4.16, yeah, thanks, thank you, thank you, John. Um, there could have been certain writings which may have been permanently lost. Uh, we don't have any access to it. So example, we have a reference for that here in Colossians 4.16, um, where Paul is saying, look, I have written a letter, this episode, uh, which I've written, but I've also written another letter to the church in Laodicea. I want you to read them. Now, we don't have, um, so like this, there could be, we don't have a ref, uh, or, uh, uh, um, we don't have access to that episode. So there could be 
some apples that have been permanently lost and you know if I'm sure if they like example Paul's letter to Colossae if they had also found his manuscript on his letter to Laodicea maybe they would have included it so if it's lost then the thing is this we say okay whatever he may have written there is captured the, the the truth you know we see overlapping truth meaning a lot of what we find in Ephesians is also found in Philippians and Colossians so how do we reconcile that we say well it's quite possible that the truth that is uh, and we don't know we don't know what was written in, in the letter to Laodicea but how do we reconcile it the truth that we find in in the epistles the epistles that we do have should sufficiently cover what may have been presented to Laodicea. We don't know, but we're just saying that it should have been sufficiently covered. So we have what we need. God has made available to us what we need. And so even if there were certain epistles of written by Paul or any of the other apostles that may have been permanently lost, we believe that what we do have is complete and sufficient for us as the New Testament church. So that's how we reconcile that. Right? So if there are missing letters, then we don't uh, worry. Uh, we, we say, okay, God has put together what we need, and that should be sufficient. Elisha's question. How do we explain the inerrancy in or er infallibility of Scripture, even in the face of some historical accounts conflicting um, so like we said uh, if uh, and so I'm trying to think and I, I can't think right now about um, any I mean think of any major historical event that is conflicting to what we see in scripture but like uh, how would we respond to it? I'm just, I'm just giving us the way to think about it. Like we said, the law of non-contradiction. It's a, it's a logical process that we apply. That means an event took place. Let's say an event took place. And there are three reports on that event about that event now in the scripture so each of the reports may not cover all the details about that event they may not cover everything about that event so the absence of detail does not imply error it just means certain parts of the event was emphasized or recorded in three different reports that means the three different reports are not contradicting each other just because there is an absence of certain detail so the the simple example to help us understand it which i which we used last week was suppose uh, you know i i met with two people in the morning at nine o'clock i met with say you know, two people, uh, just pick their names as James and Paul or something. Let's suppose I'm meeting with somebody else in the afternoon at 12, and I say, hey, I met with James in the morning at 9 o'clock. Well, it's a true statement, because I did meet James at 9 o'clock. Then suppose I meet another person at 3 o'clock, and I said, hey, I met with Paul at 9 o'clock. That's also a true statement because I did meet with Paul at 9 o'clock. Then I met I meet somebody else later on at 5 o'clock, and I say, hey, I met with James and Paul today. That is also a true statement, because I did meet with James and Paul at 9 o'clock. So all three statements are correct. I did meet with John. I did meet with Paul. I did... Oh, what was it? James and Paul. I said, okay. I did meet with James. I did meet with Paul. I did meet with James and Paul. All three statements are correct. 
they're not contradicting each other even though there is information missing in the first two statements so uh, that's just an example to illustrate the law of non-contradiction that means if there is a record it's not complete it's partial information is missing but it's not contradicting it's not contradicting then uh, it's still correct, right? So that's one way to respond to that. Okay. So uh, let's, okay, uh, Elisha, we've got a reference here. Let me try to look at it. Second um, Kings chapter 8. So Elisha shared two references. Second Kings chapter 8, verse 25, and Second Chronicles 22, verse 2. So let me just uh, look it up here. Second Samuel um, eight twenty five. Second Samuel eight. Um, Second Samuel eight. Is that verse twenty five? I'm not seeing verse twenty five. Elisha, maybe it's a. Uh, oh, Second it's Kings. Kings. Second My Kings. mistake. My mistake. Second Kings. 8.25. So, Second Kings 8.25. In the twelfth year of Joram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, began to reign. Second Kings 8.25. Compare that with Second... So one minute. Let me make a note of this so we can compare it. Let's go compare that with Second Chronicles 22. Two. Second Chronicles 22. Two. Ahaziah was 22 years old and became king. He reigned for one year in Jerusalem. Um, So we have a mention in Second Chronicles 22 of Ahaziah and Isma, um, Ahaziah, the son of Jaram, king of Judah. Okay, so I need to look into this. Um, Okay, so um, yeah, um, Elisha, I won't be. Uh, I'm not able to answer your question right now, but let me uh, study these two scriptures. Um, and, I mean, I'm not like well versed in the history of all the kings, but definitely, uh, I have made a note of this. So let me uh, just take some time to look into it, and then uh, maybe have an answer for you in next class. Uh, meaning next week uh, I can study it after today's uh, class and then get back to you on that. Okay, uh, I I don't know offhand all the the, his, the lineage of the kings, uh, but I will do that. I will look into it and I will see how to respond to that. But good, thanks for bringing it up, and uh, we will. I'm sure there's an answer. I'm sure there's a response to it. Okay, any other questions before we move forward? All right. Uh, go ahead, go ahead, John. Uh, first, in the book of Jude, uh, I think verse 14 talks about prophecy by Enoch. Mm. Um, and we don't find it anywhere else, also. So, is, it. would it be another book, uh, Pastor? Um, so, yeah, here's an example where Jude is writing about something which we have no record about. Uh, so the big question is, how did Jude know about it? Um, so what we would, I mean, okay, let's, uh, th there are two options. And we can just think through this logically. There are two options. One is either God would have revealed that to Jude because, you know, we don't find any written record of the prophecy by Enoch. 
either God would have revealed that to Jude, or it could have been recorded somewhere in, in some other writing where um, uh, Jude may have read about it. Uh, uh, to my knowledge, uh, uh, the second option I think is not there. Of, uh, I'm not very sure, but to my knowledge, that you know, because they would have pointed out, okay, Jude would have read it in this kind of writing, but it definitely is not in any of the writings of Moses. So, uh, the most the person who would have most likely recorded it would have been Moses, but it's not there. In you know, any of his writings, essentially in the book of Genesis, uh, he just mentions Enoch. He mentions his experience with God and so on, but he doesn't record any prophetic word from Enoch. So, by a process of elimination, uh, we could say, and I'm saying again, we can't say with hundred percent confidence because there's nothing to verify it. But our our by a process of elimination, we say okay. It's something God would have revealed to Jude when he was writing this episode. We have no way to verify it because it's there's no record. So we just say, okay, maybe it was something God revealed to Jude. Do we have do we have a precedent of something like that in scripture? Uh, the answer is yes. I mean, uh, the entire all the five books of Moses are like that. You know, Moses was not around when things happened but he recorded things for us now people will say it could have been oral tradition that was passed down possible but more importantly it was a revelation given to moses by god when he was on mount sinai otherwise he would not have known for example how did moses know you know what did you know genesis 2 24 when when you know when adam said this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh how did Moses know those words? He wasn't there. Uh, it is by divine revelation. So that is a precedent where God is revealing words that were spoken by people to somebody who wasn't even alive at that time. We also have New Testament precedent example. Paul, he's writing to us, you know, and he says, "This is what the Lord Jesus said." You know, it said, "Take ye, this is my body given to you." Uh, now Paul wasn't present present there. Now, when the last supper happened, uh, he had not yet met and dis you know he we don't know whether he met and discussed this thing, but he says Paul says it was given to be by revelation. So, so basically, it, the details of what happened in that place in the in the in the last supper, Paul wasn't present there, but the Lord Jesus revealed to Paul saying, "This is what these were the words that were spoken." Yeah, this is what happened when he, you know, and and when the uh, the last supper was part when when, when that happened. So, uh, so so we have both all the New Testament examples where, uh, and I'm just quoting to. I'm sure we can find more where words were revealed to somebody who was not present. There was no other record of it. Uh, so that again, it's not conclusive, but it is. We would say a most likely way by which Jude understood or Jude knew what Enoch prophesied. Is that okay? Yes, yeah, okay. yeah, thank you. Any other questions um, that we could think about? Okay, so let's move on to talk about you know Bible translations. How did we end up with? Uh, so many versions of the Bible, and which one is you know the one that we need today? Today we have you know starting from King James and New King James and NIV and so many, so many, so many English versions um, of uh, the translations. Uh, some you know, and then there are some versions, some Bibles that they bear certain scriptures are omitted and so on and why is all of that it can be very confusing right so let's uh, so why does that happen and what 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 is it so let's understand how and we're talking only about english okay i'm not we're not talking about other languages uh, but we're talking about english english versions english translations how does it happen what is the process now um 
in most cases, it's a group of scholars who are working on the translations. Um, uh, in the past, it, there were individuals. You know, I think we could think about, um, you know, early, early, an early church, Jerome's translation, William Tyndale's. Um, so where there were individuals who worked, but subsequently it was, and and, and and even today, it's it's groups of scholars who work on these translations. But how do they go about it? So we know there are numerous Greek manuscripts. There are numerous uh, numerous manuscripts of the New Testament, numerous manuscripts of the Old Testament, and they are also available in several languages for people to look at. These were the early languages into which they were translated. Now, broadly speaking, um, manuscripts are then segregated or classified into two groups. One grouping of manuscripts is referred to as the majority text, which is um, um, where the final reading or the final statement is based on what do the majority of the manuscripts say. So we're going by what the majority of the manuscripts state. Right? So we look at all the manuscripts. And so, okay, this verse, this is what the majority say. There is another grouping of manuscripts where we are looking at what does the earliest text say. So we're looking at the date of the manuscript. Right? So we're not looking at the majority, we're looking at the earliest. So usually, um, translators are looking at both these. They're looking at, look, this is what the majority of the texts say. This is what the earliest texts say. Now, the translators need to make a decision. You know, what are they going to go with? And, and you know, uh, if there is any discrepancy, I mean, if everything is all aligned, perfect, it's easy. But that's why in certain certain texts, not all, most of us all agreed, but you have certain texts, like we mentioned a few here. And these are the common ones, right? Here, and then also in Mark 16. Certain texts, and you will also find not only texts, but you will find in many Bibles, they'll put a note there. This word is not found in the majority text, or this word is not found in the NU, the referring to the uh, the earliest text. All right, so they would put a note in the Bible just to give give the reader uh, an understanding that look, this this trans this version is done the like this, but this word is not present here or not present here. Okay. So that's just to help us through this. But the translators have to make that decision. That's the first part. But in addition to that, there are, there's an overall translation philosophy which the, the translators decide on before they start the work. What is it? So when a group of translators decide, okay, we're going to translate the Bible, we have the original Hebrew and Aramaic, we have the Greek, and then we also have the earliest translations with us. So we know, um, and these are the majority texts, this is the neutral text, this is what is here. What is the philosophy we're going to follow? So they will decide on that. Okay, somebody needs to turn off their mic. Um, see this okay thank you all right now what are we what are we going to follow so there is first of all what is referred to as a formal equivalence that means it's a word for word translation right so some versions of the bible uh 
the English Standard Version, the King James Version, the New American Standard Bible, are word for word translations. This will be called referred to as formal equivalent. So here the translator said, we're going to do word for word, and then of course put it into an intelligible English sentence. And then they may add words to make that sentence intelligible. And if they add a word, they italicize it uh, to let the reader know that that particular word is not found in the original Greek or Hebrew text. But the goal of the translators in that situation is word for word. And of course, sometimes one word may have, may have to be, you know, uh, explained with two or three words, the equivalent word, but it's an equivalent translation. Then there is functional. So we'll go through this and then we'll, then we'll understand, you know, how, how the Bible translation. Then there's another uh, way of doing it, which is thought for thought. So here the translators are not focused on doing a, word for word, their goal is, you know, hey, let's make it understandable. You know, let's get the thought across. So it's not a word for word, but I want to get the thought. What was the thought in the right in the original? What was it he what was he trying to get across? What was the original thought? Now in doing so, uh you know, maybe 90 or 95 percent may be aligned to the original thought, but there is some amount of interpretation happening because the translators are saying, this is what we think the, the writer was thinking, so therefore we are communicating that to you. So there is a little distancing in that sense. That means the translator saying, we, this is what we think the writer was saying. Then there is, an, so, so you'll have the New Living Translation, NIV, which are functional. Then you have an optimal equivalence, where we are trying to, the translators are trying to balance word for word, thought for thought. So we say, okay, we don't want to do too much of interpretation. Let's try to stay with the word for word, but then we will need to do some thought for thought in order to make it understand. See, every translation, the goal is to make it easy for the reader to understand. So you know, the, 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 the motivation is good. Uh, uh, optimal equivalence would be the, uh, I think it's um, HCSB, what's it called? Holman Christian Standard Bible. I think it's what stands for, the full form. Then. There is the essential equivalence, which is, let's try meaning for meaning. So it's not just thought for thought. You're saying, let's do a little bit of interpreting. What was the meaning of what was originally written? And then we give an equivalent meaning to today's reader. Put it in the language of, use today's language and try to put it in today's language to capture the meaning of what was said, right? So the Passion Translation would fall into that category. Example, uh, essential equivalence. And then there is paraphrase. Now in paraphrase, um, the translators are not doing word for word, thought for thought, no. They're saying, let's give a summary of what was said. So it's even more removed from proximity to the original text. The motivation here is let's just make it very easy for the reader. Let's make it more like a story, story, something that they can just, you know, read very easily. So then you have paraphrased versions. So the uh, the Living Bible, the um, Message Bible would be, you know, they would fall more in the paraphrase version. So if you look at uh, this little chart, which I think is a very useful way uh, uh, to capture this, it shows us, you know, which versions of the Bible are closer to the original in, in structure 
and which ones are more of a paraphrased version okay so this is a useful chart and and, and we'll come back we'll take a break we'll come back and we'll just kind of go through this and um, and I will explain you know what would be good for us to uh, work with and so on so let's uh, pause here we we'll go for a break and we'll come back and pick up here after the break okay and uh, also any questions we can take all right okay thank you see you in 10 minutes thanks